And today we're going to talk about uh, actionable tips and quick wins going into Black Friday and the holiday season in general. So a little bit of history about Lewis and I. Uh, so I met him originally about six years ago. Wasn't sure initially, but he's warmed on me over this time. Um, we are borderline bankrupt from going to too many uh, international Magento events. Uh, so these are free photos um, from recent ones. So the one on the left is following Meet Magento New York last year, or the year before, uh, where we had a crab fight the uh, day after. Uh, and then the one on the right is from when Lewis broke his leg in Vegas at the uh, Imagine in April. And then we can't remember where the one in the middle is from, but we know it's after uh, Imagine a few years ago. <laughs> Um, but yeah, so we've uh, done quite a lot of work together in recent years, we've worked on a few different projects um, and we've been talking about doing a talk together for years, so we decided to do it here to try and justify the cost a little bit more. Um, but yeah, so today we're going to talk about kind of quick wins. Um, so about me, so I'm based in London, uh, UK, um, I've been working um, in digital and e-com for about 10 years. Um, and I currently uh, work for a company called Vivant, um, which was recently rebranded. Um, it's essentially a small e-com consultancy focused on kind of platform selection, merchandising, growth strategy, um, and recent, more recently paid media since Josh came on board, so he'll be doing a talk tomorrow um, about that kind of offering. Um, and then I also work for Clayview, who are a um, search provider, um, mostly Magento focused, but they're essentially platform agnostic. Um, so I work with their partners, some of their bigger merchants, um, and I also work on the product a little bit. Um, and their kind of core offering is around natural language processing and more flexible merchandising. And I'll talk a bit more about search um, more later on. Uh, so I'm Lewis. Uh, I've also worked in e-commerce for about 10 years. Um, I ran a retail business prior to that before selling the business in 2013. Uh, I'm managing director of an agency called Pinpoint. We're based in Leeds. We're um, an official Magento partner uh, and we work on predominantly building Magento community and enterprise sites for uh, companies of all different sizes, working with them to help uh, kind of make more money online. Uh, so focal areas of this talk, so initially I'm going to talk a bit about search and kind of quick wins and optimizing the search function. Um, then Lewis is going to talk a bit more about using customer data effectively and CRM strategy. Um, I'll then talk about kind of merchandising and changes that can be made on the front end of your store. Um, and then Lewis will uh, finish off talking about kind of planning and provisioning for peaks. Site search. So uh, really uh, obvious one, um, but it's important to make sure that you're tracking site search in Google Analytics initially, uh, just so that you've got kind of something to benchmark from um, if you are optimizing search, um, and so that you can kind of measure what um, impact these changes are having. Um, and then also understanding performance. So this is just one example of a client I worked with recently that converts at roughly four times higher um, from search-led journeys. Um, I've seen this go up to 12 times higher. Um, and pretty much every client I've worked with has had the same kind of um, uh, performance across search. Um, and obviously, with search, uh, people generally know what they're looking for a bit more. So um, if, if they know the product they're looking for, they're inherently going to convert better. But um, more recently, I've done a couple of tests around this. So with two clients, we made their search bar a lot more prominent. John Lewis aren't my client, but um, it's the same principle. So we made the search bar a lot more prominent. Um, and we found there was an incremental increase in revenue through encouraging more people to use the search function. Um, and that was, one, by making it more prominent, and two, by... Um, encouraging people to do more advanced queries. And if you've got kind of a powerful search solution in place or you're able to um, kind of extract information from queries and serve relevant products, um, you should be encouraging them to search for more detailed things to get them through to the product detail page faster and generally convert them faster. Um, and this applies even more so on mobile. Um, so I worked with a client recently and we changed their primary navigation from uh, category to search, so kind of that Amazon-like experience, um, and it drove a significant increase in conversions on mobile. Um, so I think it's roughly 5% increase in revenue on mobile, which is quite a lot, um, particularly because they get a lot more um, traffic on mobile than desktop. Um, and this is one example um, from a retailer that I really like. So they, use, um, so they recently changed this as well. Um, and they made the search bar a lot more prominent. They uh, dark the background when it's been activated. Um, and then the search results cover the um, full screen. Um, and they also use a quick search interface, um, just so that it's a lot faster and cleaner. Um, zero results search term, so again, an obvious one. Um, but there's usually quite a lot of quick wins in this area. 
Um, so looking for um, the terms that are returning the errors and then how many people are actually using them. So this was an example that I was looking at um, for a retailer that didn't sell footwear. Uh, so they were a sports retailer and they'd been looking at it for years, um, but they, actually, they don't actually sell kind of branded footwear. Um, so this data um, we passed on to the buying team and they're still discussing it, but they haven't looked at it for a few years and now they're looking at um, stocking uh, other brands of uh, footwear. Um, and in the end, we, we decided that we couldn't really apply a synonym or a redirect or anything like that because there's not really a relevant um, result for these queries. So instead, we decided to implement um, a product recommendation block. So it's personalized based on what the user's been um, viewing on the site, um, which again made a bit of an impact. And then there was another example for this same merchant, um, which was Under Armour. So they sell, they sell a lot of sporting goods. Um, and we created a synonym for... Uh, base layers, and that drove maybe an extra five sales a week just through creating that one synonym. So this can be um, a really easy win. And then this um, example here is using Clayview, but you could also track this data in Google Analytics via um, setting up an event using G GA and GTM, um, and then extracting the query based on the error message being visible on the page. Um, so this is another uh, kind of standard report in Google Analytics that just shows where searches are being completed. Um, so this is pretty standard. Um, you can see the top one's generally going to be the home page or your kind of most visited pages. Um, but you can take this report into Excel. Um, so I um, exported it from Excel with a secondary dimension on the query that they were using and then added a formula to categorize based on the page type. So for example here, um, I could filter on product detail page and then you could look for the product detail pages where people are um, performing searches to look for uh, issues with misdirected traffic or um, out of stock issues. Um, same could be applied with categories and it could um, be a result of poor merchandising and not um, boosting the right product to the top of the product list pages. Um, but I th I'd say this is a pretty useful report um, and it can be used in a lot of different ways. Um, Adding more content into search results as well. So this is from the Royal Academy of Arts, which is a UK-based retailer. Um, and they recently added uh, category pages and uh, CMS pages into their search results. But I, see it, but I would say it's a trend um, more recently. And people are adding things like store locator pages, buying guides, even forum posts into their search results um, just to provide a richer experience. Um, and a lot of people are trying to kind of push people more through those content-led um, routes, but just this simple change here um, also allowed them to process queries for things like returns policy, delivery information, um, where the stores are. Um, so yeah, that's another quick one. Um, something a little bit different, so this is a B2B merchant based in the US, um, so they sell tattoo related products. Um, and here, this is their forum, and they've started allowing people to switch between content results and product results on their editorial sites. So they've got multiple content sites, they've got blogs, and they've got a forum. And now they can switch to the product tab to view products in line with the uh, content results. So I thought that was quite a good way of trying to expose more product to people that are, have more of an editorial focus. Um, so yeah, it's early days with them, but it'll be interesting to see the impact that has on trade. OK, so um, customer data and CRM. Um, so just talking a little bit about Magento Business Intelligence. So it's a um, tool that we use with quite a lot of our clients. It was uh, previously a company called RJ Metrics that Magento acquired, uh, I believe, last year. Um, essentially, um, it's a data warehousing tool, so you can plug data in from lots of different sources. So Google Analytics, Google AdWords, Facebook ads, any external APIs. Uh, you can import data into there. You can do anything uh, to do with, say, support tickets and bits like that. Um, and then as long as there's a common, common touch point across that data, um, you can build reports and kind of analyze that data accordingly. So um, there's two versions of uh, Magento BI. Uh, there's the Essentials version, which is $100 a month. Um, it gives you access to about 75 pre-built reports um, to give you things like time between orders, um, the prob your customer lifetime value, uh, probability of repeat orders, various things like that. Uh, and then there's BI Pro, which is uh, about $500 a month, or starting price of $500 a month. Um, and that gives you a lot more ability to integrate with further things uh, and kind of get more reports off the back of that. Um, from a business standpoint, uh, BI essentially allows you to spend more time collating data, normalizing it, and moving it uh, into a format that's actually useful. Um, you can make more informed decisions on advertising spend, uh, improving your uh, customer lifetime value uh, and your customers' buying habits. 
and you can provide a uh, higher ROI on campaigns, uh, improving sales, and ultimately accelerate your business growth. So it's something that we use with quite a few of our um, clients now. Um, here's a report that I pulled together yesterday from Beyond. Um, it pulls, uh, it's basically around segmenting customers based on their regions. So over the kind of holiday season, you might have stores um, that kind of complement your online side of things. So uh, what I've done here is pulled together a list of all of the orders uh, and the regions um, based on shipping, uh, the shipping regions of the customers that place those orders and then sorted it in order of um, where the most orders came from. Um, so what we can do with this is then start targeting promotions towards people in those specific customer regions um, and kind of target relevant products and categories um, and kind of build upon that from there. Uh, this is uh, the customer segmentation feature in Magento Commerce. Um, this essentially allows you to build customer, uh, segment your data based on certain uh, attributes that you collect from your customers. So some examples here would be customers who purchased X brand. Um, you could segment based on age. So if you capture date of birth in the checkout, you can then segment the customers based on their age and you can use the standard implementation of Magento um, to kind of influence banners and various other things to those segments. So um, if it's a younger customer, you might change the images on your site to kind of target those customers more, more than the, the kind of um, older customers. Uh, you can then export those segments into your ESP of choice. So if you're using companies like Dotmailer or um, MailChimp, you can export that data and then kind of add those into automated workflows to uh, target them better. Um, one of the companies that we've been working with in the UK is Supercuts. Um, we've been helping them to kind of capture more data about their customers over the last few months. Um, and we're using a system called Magebird, which is an extension for um, Magento. Uh, it allows you to create various pop-ups. You can do um, split tests, show the pop-ups across or different pop-ups on different devices, um, automatically apply coupon codes to the basket when people enter in their, um, their email address. Um, you can do things like where pages, uh, which pages the pop-ups show and don't show on. Um, and you can even, even show pop-ups based on certain items being added to the cart. Um, I know there's other systems called uh, Wise like Pops. WisePops, which Paul uses with some of his clients. Um, and companies like Dotmailer also have a, a kind of pop-up solution where you can capture data and uh, kind of add to that um, for your customers. Um, using this particular example, um, we've had about 6% 6 6 of all users are entering in their email address on this side. Um, so we're building a big email address list, um, which we can then use to kind of target those customers over Black Friday, Cyber Weekend, and into uh, peak. Um, we found that by giving the customers a 10% discount on that side, um, we did increase the conversion rate of sales on the site. Um, we also reduced the average order value of the basket very slightly. But when we were using Magento BI, we could see that the customer lifetime value was actually quite high. Um, most customers went on to place second, third, and fourth orders. Uh, and the second order that those customers actually spent, um, that that customer actually made, was actually of a higher value. Um, so using the BI tool alongside this enabled us to kind of understand that data a bit further uh, and see, um, see the stats from that side. Um, another company we work with in the UK is Pretty Little Thing. Uh, they're an online fast fashion retailer. Um, they're doing some things at the moment around trying to build hype uh, for Black Friday. So um, simple landing page. Uh, customers can go on there, enter their email address, and they get entered into kind of a, an automated program that sends them triggered e emails out on the run up to Black Friday. Um, helps to just keep in touch with your customers, engage with them on the run up to Black Friday, and means that when you're uh, sending out those promotions over that weekend, they're not just a cold email that they're receiving. They do actually have some kind of knowledge that you are going to be doing promotions over that period of time. Uh, so a company we've been working with over the last few um, months is uh, MageMail, who are sponsoring the event. Uh, they're a um, easy to set up triggered email app for Magento. So myself and Paul did some work with the company um, a while ago building uh, their kind of new analytics platform, 
uh, the V3 version of their system uh, and basically getting very heavily involved in the product team side of things. So we built this, um, this the kind of V3 version of the platform. Um, example triggers are things like abandoned carts. Um, you can do uh, replenishment reminders, birthday emails, uh, wish list reminders, various things like that. So in this example, I'm just setting up an abandoned cart email. Um, within here, you can basically change the subject line. Um, you can change any information within the template very quickly and easily. Uh, and then it's just a case of enabling the campaign at the end. So here, just putting in a note to say, if you've got any problems with the order, uh, feel free to call us on our store number. Um, and just very easy to set up. Uh, we normally recommend setting up two abandoned cart emails, so one within kind of an hour of purchase and maybe one 24 hours later. This is a really, really quick way of implementing it. Um, and there's a lot of other companies like the Dotmailer, Bronto, various other systems that also do the triggered email side of things that are a bit more tailored to um, your particular setup. Um, so I'd definitely recommend having a look at this. Uh, so a few quick stats just on abandoned cart. So around 70% of all customers um, will abandon. This is taken from a Baymard report. Um, according to e-consultancy, most abandonments happen between kind of uh, 8 and 9 p.m. Uh, on Thursdays. This is in line with very kind of popular shopping periods. 44% uh, of cart abandonments um, happened because of shipping rates being too high. So this is quite a good tip over kind of Black Friday, Cyber Weekend, going into peak where you might want to do promotions to give free shipping. Um, a lot of customers also get put off by um, hidden costs and things in the checkout. Um, and you can expect to recover around 29% of abandoned carts um, or up to 29% of abandoned carts by implementing some kind of automated workflow on that side. Um, few example reasons why users abandon. So the hidden cost shipping rates, uh, it might be tax that's added in the basket. Um, could be that there's a very complicated checkout process and that customers are getting frustrated with that. Um, potentially issues with website. Um, and then it can even be simple things like customers on their mobile um, or uh, they, the phone's rung or anything like that side. So um, a few companies we kind of regularly work with on that side uh, for building all of the abandoned cart things as uh, Dotmailer, MailChimp, and MageMail. Uh, another small tip over the uh, weekend. So within Magento Commerce, you can um, build reports around customers that have added uh, items to their wish list. So uh, using this particular example, you can add a date range. You can see all of the customers and products that they've added to their wish list. And then you can export that out into your third party ESP. Um, one thing we would recommend is over the Black Friday uh, weekend, trigger out an email to say, you've got items in your basket. We'll give you X percent off or we'll give you free shipping and try and encourage and incentivize those customers to um, place an order um, with the items that they've already kind of added to their cart. Um, so merchandising and on-site quick wins. Uh, so this, in my opinion, is one of the most underutilized reports in Google Analytics. Uh, so what I've done here is gone to site content, all pages, changed the primary dimension to page title, and then filtered based on the meta title of the error page. So um, this is basically telling you how much visibility all of your 404 pages are getting. Um, in the past, I've worked with clients and had um, a really positive impact by just fixing these. Um, if you're working with a retailer that doesn't have uh, an optimal process in place for fixing discontinued products, discontinued categories, things like that, you're likely to have some pretty um, visible pages that are um, no longer active. Um, if you've recently replatformed and you've got a lot of legacy um, pages, same principle. Um, and fixing these can um, have a positive impact on uh, user journeys um, and even more so for paid traffic. So I once worked with a retailer that had £6,000 a month of ad spend being exposed to uh, 44 pages, um, which is a really positive change. And most retailers I work with have some kind of um, issue here, and it's a really easy, quick win going into peak because you're going to have a lot more traffic, probably going to up your spend on um, paid channels. Um, so yeah, nice, easy, quick win. Um, looking at visibility versus stock, so uh, this isn't necessarily relevant to everyone. Um, so I've recently been working on a project um, which I've been quite hands-on with, um, which is an M2 community build. Um, and they have multiple warehouses and multiple international websites within Magento. And due to a series of bugs and the way that they've approached it, um, they're unable to um, have products visible 
or set products to be visible in one website and not the others, essentially. So if a product um, is available in one warehouse and not the other one, um, they can't control um, whether that's then um, being kind of uh, promoted on different product list pages and available on the front end. So um, I created this report. So I took the um, product list page uh, report from the enhanced e-commerce module in Google Analytics, exported it into Excel, imported um, product inventory against the SKU, and then did a VLOOKUP and then pulled the stock status against that SKU to get product list uh, views against um, low stock items. Um, so here, for example, the two that I've highlighted have zero stock. They've had 22,000 impressions between them, um, and they've had a number of product detail page views, but no add to carts. So that's an example of where, unfortunately, the merchandiser would need to go in and manually um, negate that product or um, change it to be not visible in the um, relevant websites. Um, but it's still a really good report to run, regardless. So if you've got products that are low on stock, and maybe the most orders you can get over the next month uh, can be two, you probably shouldn't be um, merchandising it. Um, and this data, you could also pull in different variables, like conversion rate of different products and various other uh, kind of metrics, um, and then use it for visual merchandising. Um, address validation, so this is a relatively simple one that a lot of people already have, but um, I thought I'd include it because one of my clients recently uh, started using Capture Plus, um, so this is the O'Neill's implementation, um, but my client started using it and had a really positive impact on cart abandonment. Um, so yeah, I thought I'd mention it. I think Addressy is the equivalent in the US. Um, this was a UK client, um, and Crafty Clicks is worth looking at as well, and I've had a couple of other clients that have used the... Um, Google API, which is free, so there's no um, cost per lookup. Um, so yeah, maybe looking at one of those could be a good win. Um, upsells on site and within customer comms. So uh, this example here is from Trickers, which is a luxury shoe retailer in the UK. Um, they've got an overlay um, which appears on add to cart of a high value item and it promotes um, complementary products. So you can see like shoe polish, um, a, sh a wooden shoe box, things like that. Um, and this is a good way to increase average order value. Um, around uh, going into the holiday period, people are going to be buying more gifts, so you can apply this same principle to gifting related items. Um, and you could also use these product recommendation blocks. So I think this is using Nosto, which is my recommended solution, as you can um, create thresholds for products and you can also personalize the recommendations based on uh, what the user's done on your website. Um, and these blocks could then be pushed into transactional emails, product review requests, um, and they could be used across the site as well. Um, so I'd recommend doing this and also looking at Nosto. Um, again, it can be quite an easy win. Um, I had a client that added um, personalized product recommendation blocks to transactional emails um, and generated a lot of um, income as a result. So um, planning and provisioning uh, in, in line with Peak. So uh, it's kind of worth looking at Google Analytics and uh, your data warehousing tools to analyze retrospective data. So uh, looking at categories that have sold particularly well um, in the previous year, as well as products, um, and then looking at the channels that drove the traffic to those particular, uh, to those particular categories and products. Um, using uh, Magento's inbuilt content scheduling and preview feature. So this basically allows you to build campaigns within Magento. Um, you can assign text changes or static block changes, content changes, banner changes, various other things within um, a particular campaign, and you can change a campaign at various times during a day or spread it over a certain period of time. So an example was one of, a cli one of our clients that we've just launched on Magento 2 Enterprise. Um, they, um, over Halloween, have got various banners, promotions, um, kind of text changes on their site um, that are implemented uh, over Halloween, and then moving into Black Friday and into the Christmas period, um, we're going to be building out the kind of different types of campaigns available on that side. Um, within the staging and preview feature of Magento, you can view the site on a particular day, so you can plan all the way up to kind of Christmas, see how um, see how the site will look on, say, the, the 14th of December, um, and kind of run round as if you were a customer on that side. Um, Misguided did a really good job. They didn't use a, the content scheduling preview because it's a, a fairly kind of new feature in this particular setup. Um, but they ran offers on their site a couple of years ago over Black Friday every, um, every hour. Um, and this would just help to make things a lot more kind of straightforward on that side. Um, 
worth finding out where your customers are from. So again, using uh, GA or BI, um, have a look at where traffic's coming from, where visitors are coming from. Um, worth considering implementing a CDN uh, to serve assets to your, such as images, to your users kind of quicker. Um, using the performance tester that Security have uh, enables you to kind of see the connection time, time to first byte, and the total load time um, of the store in different locations. And if you are selling kind of worldwide, just making sure that your load time isn't going to be degraded by um, the increased traffic um, on your site. Um, a few very quick optimization tips um, from a, on the kind of more technical side. So um, compressing store images. So there's a, a bash script um, called Tinyfy. allows you to do lossy and lossless compression on your images. Um, you can run this via a cron um, on your server or as a one-off. Um, we had a client who came to us maybe six or seven months ago. Their homepage was just, just short of 20 megabytes to load. Um, and uh, they were getting kind of eight second load times. Um, with quite a lot of traffic to the site. Um, we optimized all the images on the site, and we got it just to, to just short of 2 meg, um, which was a massive improvement on their side. Um, disabling and rotating customer logs. So Euro have a really good extension to handle this. As you start getting increased, performance, uh, increased traffic on the site, you will find that you start logging more data. That can kind of degrade performance, um, cause issues on that side. Um, so if you've got no need to kind of log that customer data, um, you can disable it using that, or you can rotate it on kind of a 7 or 30 day basis. Um, using tools such as New Relic um, allows you to identify bottlenecks in um, your code. So um, anything that might be causing issues, it's good to use New Relic to just monitor things in the background, uh, and then you can always uh, make sure that that's in place prior to um, Black Friday. And then a more obvious one, just in terms of disabling any unused uh, and excessive code, uh, kind of goes without saying that if you're not using extensions anymore, make sure they're disabled. It removes complexity and uh, speeds up the site on that side. Um, Big fan of kind of planning just in case something does go wrong. There's a service called Qit. Essentially, it's a virtual waiting room system. Um, it sits in front of your website, and you can set a particular level where if you exceed that, the, the queue system um, kicks in, um, captures email addresses of users to let them know when the site is available again. Um, it's a bit of a fail safe to make sure that if you do run into issues with traffic, you don't lose all of your customers by your server going offline. You can um, keep the vast majority of your customers there, and then just have that overflow going into the Qit system. Uh, and then a few kind of final thoughts. So plan far in advance, go into code freeze early. Um, speak with your host and let them know if you're kind of planning uh, to have huge peaks in traffic. You can look at your previous year's data, um, see how your growth's coming, and have kind of an, an intelligent guess as to um, how much traffic you're going to be getting. Um, don't do anything that, uh, that kind of causes increased um, stress on the server. So be mindful of things like cron jobs. So if you're uh, running backup scripts or expense, uh, exporting large numbers of orders to third-party systems, um, you might be running reporting uh, scripts or something in the back end of Magento. Just be mindful of what time they're running. Uh, and then kind of always plan for failure. So if something goes wrong um, and you don't have a kind of plan in place for that, it'll be a mad rush to kind of get it fixed. Um, at least if you've got some kind of fallback plan, uh, that's, that's good. Um, Eric from Mage Mojo is doing a talk about their uh, Mojo Stratus system at 2.30 today. Um, it's a, a hosting solution built on AWS that's auto-scaling, so I'd definitely recommend having a look into that side. Thank you very much. Can we over